All right, everybody, we're jumping into an ad real quick, and this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes it feels like we're so focused on what we're doing for work, family, each other, the pets, but when was the last time we took a breath and kind of focused on ourselves? Therapy can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. Peyton and I both talk about therapy a lot and the importance of it. Um, It's something that Peyton does every week and something I probably should do as well. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can actually switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash husband today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash husband. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to our podcast. This is Murder With My Husband. I'm Peyton Moreland. And I'm Garrett Moreland. And he's the husband. And I'm the husband. Okay, everyone. We are so excited to announce that we have some brand new custom merch dropping now. We have been getting a ton of messages and comments. When is some new merch coming? We've been working on it. It's here. It is finally here. It is definitely... We like it a lot. I think it's definitely my favorite so far. Yeah. Um, it's super fun. We're calling it the In Murder Mode drop. Um, there's a little ghosties. You can check it out. The links are probably everywhere. But yeah, do go check it out. It is definitely, like I said, my favorite merch drop. It'll be live either until it sells out or for a couple of weeks. Again, there's going to be links everywhere. There'll be a button that says merch. Uh, go and check it out. All right, Gary, you got your 10 seconds. I feel like I'm in this mood recently that I'm just sick of all food. You know what I'm saying? I am too. Like Peyton and I eat out quite a bit, and that's probably why. We probably need to like start cooking some food. But I'm just like over food, which is weird because I love food. Like I love it. But I don't know. I'm just over it. So as you know, well, maybe you don't know. As Peyton and I know, we have cameras all over our house. And there's a camera in front of our house that gets like our driveway and like basically our street. And there are these kids, college kids, high school, I think college. I want to say college and maybe freshman year. I don't know. Anyways, they've been having ragers like every other Saturday, just crazy parties. And then we'll look at the camera at like 1 or 2 a.m. There's like 50 kids in the street. There's like beer cans everywhere. It's insane. They're just riding in the back of these Jeeps, just screaming, like oh, honking their horns. They're going hard. And I don't care. I'm not going to call the cops. Like, it not, does not surprise me, though, that there's no one on the street that cares. That cares. Good for them, though. You know, they're living. We all life. have this camaraderie. We're like, okay, we'll just let them do yeah. it. YOLO. Ent- until they do something like too out of hand. Yeah. And then everyone calls the cops. But no, they just, I don't know. I feel like it's every other weekend. It's at like 1 or 2 a.m. when it starts getting really loud. I think it's when they're all leaving. Yeah. They're all exiting the home and leaving. And Daisy freaks out. Yeah. But, yeah, so I doubt one of them listens to this. But if you do, hey. Yeah. Don't come over and say hi because I'm sleeping. But, yeah, so that's basically what's been going on. Just hanging out with the Ragers and not eating food. All right. Our case sources this week are the Times of India, the Hindu.com, Outlook India, Crime Files, News18.com, IndiaTimes.com, HowStuffWorks.com, DNAIndia.com, The Statesman, Google Maps, and Tribune.com. All right. So everyone loves a wedding, right? I actually put this in because Garrett and I really genuinely do not love weddings. We don't. And I am sorry for anyone that's ever invited us that are our friends and we haven't gone because we just don't like weddings. It's weddings and funerals. Yeah, weddings and funerals. Well, funerals, I mean, I feel like that's kind of obvious. Yeah. But weddings, I'm sorry. It's not happening. Like, even with the free food. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah. I don't really have much to say about it because we're just not big wedding fans. Is it really free because you have to bring a wedding gift? It's true, too, actually. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's keep going. Okay, but, I mean, I think a lot of people do like weddings. And no matter where in the world people are, no matter where people live, people do have weddings they love weddings they speak to a new beginning to the promise of a bright future to the devotion of a loving couple to the seeds of a growing family 
Engagements and weddings are a major cause for celebration, just as they should be. And having a celebration is exactly what the Batia family is doing this week in our case. They're busy celebrating because 33-year-old daughter, Priyanka, just got engaged. And if you can't tell by the case sources and the names, our case this week is taking place in India. And there are a lot of names that I I looked them up and I really practiced. So please bear with me and you know forgive me if I do get some words wrong, but I did try to look all of them up and I'm going to do my best. Everyone be nice, please. <laughs> So Priyanka, our 33-year-old who just got engaged, is very intelligent and she works for an IT company and now she's getting married too. It's June 2018 and the large extended family is together celebrating her big announcement. And this isn't rare for the Bhatias. They live in a world where family is everything. Three generations of the Bhatia family live together in their two-story home in Barari, India. And since the engagement, they've been dancing and staying up late and telling stories and making plans and talking about dresses and hairstyles. I mean, it's it's basically just an excuse for them to just all get together, celebrate and talk. The engagement festivities start around June 17th. And by June 23rd, the last of the out-of-town family members have left to go back home. They're done celebrating the engagement. I have actually, I mean, had a few friends on Instagram that have attended Indian weddings. I assume I'm saying that right. Um, They they go all out. Yeah. Like they go, they're days long. They have all these celebrations and cultural celebrations. Like it looks... Looks like a party. And that's why I'm like not that surprised that just the engagement itself like had a four-day party yeah. to go along with it. Mm-hmm. It's so fun. Um, but there are still plenty of people in the Batia family household even after the extended family guests have gone. And that's because 11 members of the family live together. Okay. This is very common in India and they span in age from 15 to 77 years old. Families are close in India and multiple generations often do live together just like the Bhatia family. Here, the family living together in the household includes Priyanka, our one who just got engaged. And I'm just going to kind of lay out an outline of the family tree here. Don't worry if you don't memorize all of them because I'll keep reminding us. Priyanka is the granddaughter of Narayani, who's 77 years old. And Narayani, the grandmother, has five adult children and three of them live with her in this house, along with their spouses and their children. So Narayani's older son, Bhavnesh, who's 50, lives there with his wife, Savita, their 25-year-old daughter, Nitu, their 23-year-old daughter, Monu, and their 15-year-old son, Drav. So basically just the son and his family. Okay. So that's one of Narayani's sons. And her other son who lives there is named Lalit. And at 45, Lalit is the youngest son, and he lives there with his wife, Tina, and their 15-year-old son, Shivam. So just to be clear, we have two 15-year-olds in the household, their cousins, and they both attend the local public school. Okay. Then finally, Narayani's daughter, Pratiba, who's 57 and widowed, lives there with her daughter, Priyanka. This is the daughter slash granddaughter who just got engaged. So those are the 11 members of the Bhatia family who are living together in the same household. Narayani's husband, Bhopal, who was the family patriarch, passed away in 2007, 11 years previous to our story. So with so many family members spanning so many ages, it's safe to say the entire neighborhood in this part of Barari knows the Bhatia family. Barari is a fairly densely populated district of North Delhi with narrow streets and houses very close together or even touching. And even though the population of Barari in 2018 is somewhere between 150,000 and 190,000 people, neighbors here know each other. They like to go for walks together. They socialize together. No one has ever known the Bhatia family to argue or to cause any problems or to say a cross word about anyone. They're well-liked and well-respected. The Bhatia family has also been doing well financially, and they even have a couple of successful family businesses going that basically pays for everyone to live in this house. 
One of the businesses is run by Lalit. He was the youngest of the sons. And it's a plywood shop operating right from the ground floor of the family home. And the family lives up on the higher levels above the shop. Lalit is very quiet and reserved, but he's universally considered to be a kind man. Then Bhavnesh, who just a reminder is Lalit's older brother, runs the local grocery store and so he interacts with everyone in the neighborhood. He's outgoing and friendly and everyone likes to stop by and chat with him. He's up every morning like clockwork to go to the local Ram Temple for prayers at 5.30 a.m. as well. The whole family goes to services, but Bhavnesh is the one who's always there every morning you could count on it. Then after his prayers, Bhavnesh goes to run their family-owned grocery store. He gets to the store every day by 5.45 or 6 a.m. at the latest so that he can be there to accept the morning's milk delivery from the delivery truck. Then all the neighbors get up and come to the store early in the morning and buy their daily milk. So this is basically what the family's life looks like in 2018. And everything is perfectly normal on Saturday, June 30th at the Bhatia family household. The businesses are running fine and everyone is happy and healthy. That night at around 11 p.m., Bhavnesh takes Tommy, the family dog, out for a short walk. And right around the same time at 11 p.m., Priyanka is excitedly talking with relatives about her wedding. Apparently, this is during a phone call with some cousins. So she's just having like a group call, basically. Mm -hmm. And at some point that evening, a neighbor named Hement sees and congratulates Priyanka while he's out for his post-mill walk. So it just kind of seems like everyone in this neighborhood loves to walk. Yeah, everyone's walking and talking. Yeah. So early on Sunday morning, this would be the next morning, July 1st, 2018. Sometime before 6 a.m., the neighbors hear the incessant honking of the milk delivery truck. And this is not normal. It's honking and honking and raising quite a ruckus. The reason for all the commotion is that Bravnesh's grocery store isn't open yet. Typically, he would run out and grab the milk, but he's not answering the truck this morning. He's not there. No one from the Bhatia family is there that morning to accept the day's milk delivery. And this is unheard of. At 5.56 a.m., the milk delivery truck needs to be on its way, and so it ends up just leaving the milk out there in front of the store. The neighbors, of course, notice all of this, and they start to get worried. One of the neighbors, a man named Gurchuran Singh, is out and about early for his customary morning walk. He runs a nearby photocopy shop. He often walks with members of the Bhatia family, and he knows as well as anyone how unusual it is that no one from the family is out and about this morning, and he's concerned that the store isn't open yet. By 7 a.m., Bhavnesh's grocery store is still not open, and this is so unusual that Gurchuran can't take it anymore. He goes to the Bhatia's 11-person house to see what's going on. Hmm. He calls out at their door, but no one answers. So he gingerly tries the door, and he finds it unlocked. It's probably useful to note that Gurchuran has never actually been inside the Bhatia's home. In fact, not a lot of people have been inside the Bati home. Yeah. They come out and they talk to everyone, but they don't really invite people over or welcome people in. So he pushes the door open and he tentatively steps inside the Bati's house at 7.14 a.m. Is that weird? Like he's never been in there, but now he's like, ah, I guess I'll go inside. I think it's just that this family is so well known in the neighborhood uh-huh. that when no one sees them, he's, he's like, no, I think something's, something's going on. Yeah. Okay. So there's a courtyard where he first goes, and this is called like the lobby of the house. And then he goes inside just a little bit further into a hallway. This hallway has a large iron mesh up top that's part of the ceiling. So just think like an iron grate basically on the ceiling. Okay. And here, just inside the house, Gertrude sees something so shocking in that hallway that he'll run out of the house screaming. He's running through the entire neighborhood, screaming at the top of his lungs about what he's just seen. And what he's screaming is that he's seen six or seven members of the Batia house hanging by their necks. Oh my gosh. In an eerie circle shape from the ceiling in the hallway together. He screams that they've all taken their lives. What? Emergency calls start flooding in from the neighbors to the police control room. Gertrude's screams almost immediately attract a crowd and the neighbors begin flocking to the outside of the Bhatia's house to see what's going on. Head constable Rajiv Tamar arrives on the scene 
four minutes later at 7.18 a.m. Tamar pushes aside a few people who are already crowding around the home, blocking the narrow lane. Tamar is the first police officer to enter the Bhatia's home. Okay. As he later quoted in the Hindu.com, he says, In my career of 17 years so far, I have never seen a crime scene like this, and I hope I do not ever have to. I, I'm curious, like, were they in a cult secretly or like what's going on? Well, the truth is, it's not just six or seven bodies hanging. What Constable Tamar finds are 10 bodies hanging. They're hanging from long strips of fabric, hanging from the square iron wire rail that's part of the ceiling over the hallway. The bodies are all hanging very close together in that circular pattern. What? And to add world? to the shock and the horror of this scene is the fact that once police arrive, they immediately do not think this was a mass suicide. The first reason being, mm. all the bodies are blindfolded. Their eyes are covered with cloth. Seven of the bodies have their hands tied behind their backs with wire, and three have their hands oh, tied in well. front of them. Okay. Some of the bodies even have their feet tied. They all have cotton plugs in their ears. All of their mouths are gagged with cotton and cloth. This is nuts. And all of their faces are wrapped and almost entirely covered with cloth. So you said there's 10 of them and there's 11 people that live there. So obviously there's somebody missing. Yes. Constable Tamar goes into the next room and that's where he finds Narayani Devi. This is the 77 year old mother and grandmother, basically the head of the house. Okay. She's the only one not hanging but she's dead on the floor with ligature marks around her neck. She's got a shawl around her neck and there's also a belt near her body and her body is the only one not blindfolded. So I want to say the India Today described it, the scene as this. Yellow, orange, pink, beige, yards of drapes descended from the iron mesh ceiling of the hallway like an elaborate stage setting. From every loop dangled a dead human body, a choreography of puppets on strings. So that's what they described this scene, like when you first walked in, which is so eerie yeah. and so scary. I'm just so confused how that's a lot of people to be hanging. Right. Like I get maybe like a mass murder, everybody's shot, but for everybody to be hanging. With hands tied behind their I've back, never... feet tied. So all told, 11 people are dead comprised of the entire Bhatia family who was living in the house. Seven women, two men, and two teenaged boys. The only survivor of the entire family is the family's dog, who's found tied above the wire mesh where the family's bodies are hanging, but he has high fever and is very ill. Throngs of people are now in the streets. The mass hanging quickly makes national news in India. Eleven ambulances arrive through the throngs of people in the narrow street to take away the eleven bodies. It will take some time for the authorities to complete so many autopsies and to prepare the detailed autopsy reports. So in the meantime, the police can't begin to fathom what has happened here. Some believe it's a mass murder. Some believe it's a suicide. But it's safe mm. to say the theories begin running wild in town. I don't think it was a mass murder. I am leaning towards some sort of suicide. I don't know if they were in a coal. I don't know if... I don't know, someone, I mean, I guess it could have been a murder by someone in the family and he made all them jump, but I don't, I'm not sure. Right. So the police begin their investigation by combing through the house, searching for answers as to how an entire family of 11 who'd just been happily celebrating an engagement could all end up gagged, tied up and hanging together in a circle without a single neighbor in this densely populated neighborhood hearing a peep of what's going on. Remember, the houses are so close together. Yeah. It's very it's very cramped. This is what the police investigators find. There are no signs of forced entry. There are no signs of struggle inside the house. The police see no signs of defensive wounds on the body, but that will have to be verified with autopsies. It appears that nothing was stolen from the house. In fact, the police find the family's expensive gold jewelry in a cupboard along with other valuables. The cloth strips that the 10 bodies are hanging from all look like they've come from a single bed sheet. There are five stools what? by the 10 bodies. 
The family's eight cell phones are found hidden and taped inside of a drawer. Mm, That's weird. Okay. There is no suicide note. There is no sign of drugs or poison in the house, meaning there's no evidence that someone or one of the family members drugged the rest. The kitchen is clean. It doesn't appear that any cooking happened the previous night. The police find a receipt in the house that shows that the family had ordered 20 roti. Okay, I think it's roti, rotis. It's basically Indian flatbreads from a local restaurant the night before and that it got delivered between 10 and 11 p.m. The police reach out to extended family and they speak to Narayani's elder son, Pradeep, who lives several hours away along with a daughter who both say that the family would never take their lives nor would they ever murder their mother or grandmother. Because remember, she has two kids who don't live with the family. And when they find out what's happened, they're like, no, this would never happen. There was nothing going on. How could have someone gone in there and done this to all 11 of them with no sign of evidence, no neighbors hearing, nothing? Yeah. Well, and the family members say everyone was happy Um, And the neighbors, they don't believe the suicide theory either. One neighbor says they spoke to one of the family members just the night before. It was Priyanka, remember, on the walk. She just got engaged. She had just been celebrating. They're like, she wouldn't then turn around and Mm. take her life. That's true, yeah. The police initially classified this as a murder case, especially because of the way Narayani's body was found on the floor with ligature marks around her neck. There are many eyes on the house at this point and people and police can't help but notice something strange about the home. And this is where I say that the rumors, I mean, 11 people found hanging in a circle is definitely going to be shocking news that's going to quickly start turning cult, devil, Uh uh uh, all kinds of things. So people notice that there are 11 pipes inexplicably jutting out of the white exterior wall of the Batia's home. These pipes were installed very, very recently, and they're facing an empty plot between the home and the next building over. Significantly, four of the pipes are mounted straight out, and seven of the pipes are mounted downwards. And everyone can't help but notice there are four men who died in the house and seven female. Okay. Plus, that's 11 pipes altogether. 11 people died. So they're like, coincidence? I don't know. Yeah, but pipes. I mean, what what do the pipes do? Well, many people immediately jump to the conclusion that the pipes are somehow connected to the deaths, that the family had them installed as part of the suicide pact in order to let their souls travel safely out of the house once they take their lives. So they believe that this was like their route, that they installed these as a way for their souls to safely leave. Okay. The police look into this theory and they even interview the plumber who like installed them. And he's like, No, I installed this to ventilate the property because the plywood business below the house, there were a lot of fumes. It was getting very hard to breathe in there. And so they asked me to come install these pipes so that we could kind of ventilate it. It would be a weird coincidence. There happens to be 11 of them. And, okay, the number 11 will actually keep surfacing throughout this case. Got it. Like, it's going to keep coming up. Which is hard because I feel like when you are looking for something, though, you're going to see it. Right. Like if I'm looking for something, it just it happens to always pop up around me. Right. And I think this next 11 example is kind of like that. People can't help but notice that the main gate of the house has 11 rods. Yeah. Not I mean, 10. Nah. And a welder who put in the rods is interviewed and he's like, no, it's just a coincidence. Yep. It was just the design of the rods. But as you will see, like I said, keep, stay tuned because more 11s are going to keep popping up. Many in the neighborhood become spooked by all of this. They start saying the house is haunted. Like, how can 11 people die in a house and it not be haunted? Mm -hmm. Um, It kind of just starts having a mind of its own once the investigation starts. Okay. So, Garrett, I know you're wondering because it's 2018. And you will be relieved to hear that some of the houses in the neighborhood do have oh, surveillance thank cameras. Oh, freaking goodness. And this is something the police check into right away. And the police quickly discover that the house right across the street has surveillance cameras pointing directly at the Bati house. You can okay. see their entire house. And the cameras are working the night of the murder. All right, what they find? Or of it. the deaths, I should say. The police are able to watch the recordings of who came and went from the Batia household the night before they were all found dead. This will obviously be a huge help in the investigation. And what the police see, though, or what they don't see, is shocking to the surviving extended family members. You see, no 
outsiders entered the house the entire night. Okay. But that's not all. On June 30th at 10 p.m., just nine hours before the family is found hanging, video cameras from the house across the narrow street show Nitu and Savita, this is Bhav Nesh's daughter and wife, carrying those plastic stools toward the house. No way. These five stools are the same ones that are going to be found right by the 10 hanging bodies. Okay. Then at 10.15 p.m., Drov and Shivam, the 15-year-old cousins who go to school together, are captured on video going down to Lilith's plywood store and coming back upstairs with a bundle of wire cables from the store. These wire cables are going to be what's used to bind the hands and feet in the hangings. So the own family members are getting the equipment for the hangings. Was there anyone that wasn't bound or was every, not every single person was bound, correct? Seven were bound with their hands behind their back. Three were bound with them in front. Oh, so they were all bound. They were all bound. They were okay. all blindfolded. But three in front. Three in front. Okay. Seven behind and then grandma in the other room was had ligature marks and not blindfolded. Okay. At 10.57 p.m., Bhavanesh is on video as he takes the dog for a walk, remember? And at 11.04 p.m., he returns. This will be the last sighting on that video of anyone in the family. And then, roughly nine hours later, they will all be hanging or dead. There are no more comings or goings from the house that night. There's also a report that family members are on video earlier in the day at the store buying the bandages that will be used to gag their mouths and tie up or cover their eyes. So earlier in the day, they also bought the stuff that is then found around them. Oh man, there's gotta be, there's something going on. They gotta be look into something. I just, there's something. I'm just waiting for you to say it. Police agree with you. Okay. So they keep searching and they make another huge find this one is inside of the house. Here, the police find 11 notebooks or diaries filled with writings and notes plus hundreds of additional loose pages of handwritten notes. The police pour through all of these notes. The entries are dated and they go back 11 years to the date. Okay. The notes are spiritual and superstitious. They talk about the belief that doomsday is coming. They talk about finding salvation, God, rituals. Um, the notebooks also provide an instruction manual for a ceremony called a banyan tree ritual. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see photos of what a banyan tree looks like. The biggest banyan tree in the world is found in India and it spans three and a half acres. So for those listeners Whoa. who can't see, banyan trees are unusual looking because these trees send roots down from their branches into the ground. Oh, I've, I've seen these before. Allowing them to spread laterally for very mm -hmm. long distances. According to the notebooks, the banyan tree ritual involves the family hanging down like the banyan's tree's roots. All right, here we go. So, I mean, think of the tree and then think of how they were found. Yep. The notes provide exact details of how their bodies will be arranged during this hanging ritual. And it matches with how the bodies were actually found. Their hands should be tied. Their eyes and mouths should be covered. In the notes, the directions are that everyone will tie their own hands. And when the ritual is done, then everyone will help each other untie their hands. So they're not supposed to die. Oh, no. So what happened? Wait. I don't know, keep going because I'm confused. So if this was the ritual, how did they think they were going to hang and not die? I'll get there. Okay. The police, of course, want to figure out who wrote all of these notes at this point, detailing how the hangings would be carried out or this ritual because it's not necessarily death. Yeah. Experts check the handwriting of these hundreds and hundreds of pages of notes, comparing the handwriting with known handwriting samples of the family members. Um, they want to determine who wrote them. Like what of the families were writing about all of this? Mm -hmm. Handwriting experts determine that the notes and notebook diaries are in three different hands. That's it. Only three family members participated in this. They determine that most of the notes are written by Priyanka, the 33-year-old daughter who was yeah. just got engaged. However, based on the content of the notes, the police believe that all of the notes are actually written 
at the instruction of the brother Lalit. So the youngest brother Lalit, who owns the plywood store, they believe that he was having Priyanka scribe for him. These were all from him. Some of the notes are in Lalit's handwriting and some are in a third person's belief to be Natu. This is Bravnesh's older daughter. Lalit was dictating notes to these two female family members. He, the notes state that Lalit would make them stand in a position like soldiers after their morning prayers. So the whole family was like standing in certain poses after prayers. This was for mental strength, according to the notes. They also indicate that the banyan tree ritual being done was to help a relative who was struggling financially, although this relative has no idea that they were doing any mm-hmm. of this. The notes state that at 10.40 p.m., Narayani would feed everyone rotis as a part of the ritual, which is corroborated. They ordered those. The notebook says that a bowl of water will be placed by the window. And when the water changes color after a few minutes of them hanging, their father or God will come and save them. Oh, no. There would be thunder and shaking and then they would be saved. They would all be let down from hanging and untie each other's hands. And then Um. their family member would no longer have financial trouble. I'm going to tell you that did not happen. The father or God did not come down and unhang them. That's, yeah. I don't know. It didn't happen. No. All in all, these notebooks compiled over 11 years provide notes as to exactly how the ritual would be carried out. Like I said, the doomsday predictions from the ritual will save them. The notes in the diaries are consistent with the injuries and with the way the bodies were found. The last entries in the notebooks describe that this final act, this ritual, was to take place at 1 a.m. Nine people to hang from iron mesh shilling in the hallway, the daughter from the window near the home temple, and the grandmother in the bedroom. And this is exactly how it was. The notes talk about a week-long Thanksgiving celebration leading up to the main ritual. And indeed, indeed, they were celebrating Mm -hmm. Priyanka's engagement of course keeping the entire ritual a complete secret from everyone else was a big part of the plan it's written about that this was their secret their family secret and then this is where you start getting into a little bit of a cult they're keeping these secrets they're not allowed to invite anyone inside the house i mean they're doing prayers and standing in positions and doing other rituals just the banyan tree ritual was one that didn't come to fruition. I'm surprised all 11 of them were in the same boat because I feel like, especially as a family, usually there's someone who's like, ah, this is kind of weird. I'm not really about this, but I mean, they all did it. So I'm actually going to get into that of a theory of what police believe how that Mm -hmm. happened. But first, police at this point, after reading the notes, make the stark discovery that this family did not intend to die. They did not think they were going to die that night. Yeah. So the police search everyone's phone and search histories and they find that Lilit was a big fan of paranormal and occult shows on YouTube. He would often research topics of death, the Mm. soul, life, like just all of this. So the police decide to focus in specifically on Lilit as they begin to kind of glimpse him as the mastermind a little bit of all this. They learn that he had several traumas in his life. First, Lilit suffers an injury to his head from a 1998 biking accident. Details are scarce, but he's believed to have received a traumatic brain injury. And then Lilith suffers another major injury six years later in 2004 when he's about 31 years old. And this injury will leave him unable to speak, having to relearn how to do a lot of things. And because of this, Lilith's doctor advises him to see a psychiatrist to deal with the PTSD. He's suffering as a result of the attack, but Lilith refuses. He thinks that there's you know, a stigma associated with people suffering from mental health issues, and he feels that it's not acceptable of him to go seek treatment. According to India Today, quote, no one recalls the extent of his injury, but some say he was hospitalized for weeks and did not speak for three years. Wow. Experts believe that the injury and loss of voice could have affected Lilith's mental health as speech initiates in the brain, and that area could have been seriously impacted. One source reports that Lilith's mother did not want him to discuss his PTSD symptoms. They didn't talk about it. He wasn't allowed to talk how he was feeling. It was also to be kept as a family secret. 
During the years while Lilith had lost his voice, he communicates with others by using a notepad. But then his father dies. The patriarch of the family dies. Okay. Uh-huh. And miraculously, Lilith's voice comes back. He begins speaking once the father or the grandfather dies. And he also begins taking more prolific notes. Lilith then tells the family that his father's spirit has entered his body. So grandpa has now is now living inside Lilith. Mm, all right. He even speaks in his father's voice. Lilith credits dreams of his father and prayer rituals at the behest of his father as allowing his voice to come back. So he comes forward and is like, I couldn't talk, but now father has entered me and I can speak again. And I'm speaking for him. I am now the patriarch of the family. So he kind of takes over this role. He controls the family, tells him what to do. He enforces rules such as praying three times a day and controls the rest of the family by having them stand in a line. They follow his instructions and will continue to do so more and more as the years go by. Mm. And the other family members, except for his mother, will even refer to him as daddy. So everyone starts what calling him freak? daddy. That's weird. Lilith disciplines the family once his father dies. The family is financially prosperous by obeying Lilith and their father's spirit. And this kind of encourages them to keep doing so. And this is where the psychology comes in. I can't believe they're all calling him daddy. <laughs> okay. So the psychology of this is, if there's like a miracle that surrounds, you know, someone comes forward and says, I have someone's soul in my body. People are going to be like, no, you don't. Yeah, you're insane. Mm -hmm. But someone who comes forward and hasn't been able to speak for three years and then all of the sudden can speak and says, sure, I yeah. have our father's soul. It'd be weird. They'll be like, maybe you do. Maybe you do. Yeah. Maybe you do. And then after that, the family starts getting money. They start prospering. And at the hands of the father that's speaking through the son. And yeah. so the family starts thinking, oh, well, we're following his advice. We're listening to his prophecies and now it's paying off. Yeah. Like we're making money. We're becoming financially stable. So I think how you asked, how does 11 people get in on this? Well, that's how. I think slowly, yeah. day by day, year by year. And, I mean, it makes sense. And it goes on to talk about how this all probably started with his wife and then his kid and then Priyanka and then it just slowly spread to more people that he got in on it. And then pretty soon it's the normal. Yeah. It's normal, you know? Mm -hmm. So police remain outside of the house for a solid week after the hanging, searching for clues, searching for answers. The house is now all sealed up, but the police wait outside trying to figure it all, hoping for answers. How could this have happened? By July 13th, 2018, the Joint Commissioner of Police for Delhi's crime branch announces that the autopsies are complete and that the results indicate suicide. He confirms that there are no sign of defensive wounds on the body. No force was used on any of the bodies. The autopsies also confirm that the deaths likely occurred at 1 a.m. And as for Narini, it was earlier suspected that the grandmother had died of strangulation, but forensic experts have now announced that she too died of a partial hanging. A belt was found near her body, and she was possibly oh, okay. the last to die. They think that there was a wardrobe or a cabinet, a piece of furniture that was in the room where her body was found that she tied the belt to and then hung herself in that way. This is unbelievable that an entire family literally hung themselves. Yeah. And then again, after the... What? That's so hard because they were so convinced that this was going to happen. And then it doesn't happen, obviously. I mean, yeah. they're not, they don't come back to life, whatever you want to call it. Right. But they were so convinced of it. Well, so they decide to do like a psychiatric autopsy, which uh -huh. is basically like they take in condition the bodies, the notes, the family, everything they learned. It's like I want to say like how much would that suck if you thought it was going to happen but doesn't happen, but they're dead. So it's not like they're... Well, and they confirm again through this autopsy, they did not mean to die. Like, that's oh, for, for sure. sure. No, for sure. I'm sure they didn't want to kill themselves. Yes. So this just begs the question, was this a shared psychotic disorder? Like, yeah, 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 okay. did this spread? And we've talked about this before on the podcast that, like, yeah. it can start with one person and then slowly over time. Uh -huh. But I don't think we've ever seen 11 people yeah. with a shared I mean, psychotic or delusion. Of I mean, there are a lot of different, I mean, I've, 
haven't seen, but heard of different TV s- shows and series of like cults where like 20, 30 people will all drink poison or something crazy like that. Yeah. I mean, very similar. But they're cults. Yeah. But I mean, like this was this a cult? Was this a cult? I don't know. And like, it's just, yeah, and how know. did no one see the red flags, including the extended And I family? guess I just don't, don't know enough about whatever they were into. Like, is it, is it popular over there in India? Is it not very popular? Is it kind of weird? Like, I don't know enough about that as far as maybe a bunch of people believe it. But then you also don't see a bunch of people going and hanging themselves, hoping to yeah. so help their problems. Here's my thing. I don't think it's that weird that like the neighbors didn't see the red flags or the signs because yeah. families are tight knit. Yeah. It, it, it's very common. It's very common for families to live together. It's very common. I think, you know, in the States, if you saw a family of 11 that was extended family living together, not allowing inside the house, people would be like, that's a little weird. Yeah, I don't probably. think that that's abnormal. I don't think that that's abnormal. And so I don't find it strange. I do find it strange. The other extended family the ones they were FaceTiming, I mean, it might have not been FaceTiming, it was probably calling, that night to talk about Priyanka's wedding, they had just celebrated with this whole entire family, didn't see the signs. Yeah. Well, I mean, because they didn't think they were going to die. Well, also, it was like... That's the big thing is they had... The number one rule was we have to keep it a secret. Yeah, that too, yeah. But like, how how is there nothing? Yeah. I think it's also important for me to mention that the extended family doesn't believe that it was a mass suicide still to this day. They don't? No. How? Just because they're so convinced that their family wouldn't have hid it from them? Yeah. They I mean, think that some, that, it, that something else happened, that it was murders and not suicide. I mean, considering all the evidence they found, there's no way. I mean, it's exactly what they did is, I mean, it's written in journals. Like, what? Yeah. I don't know how much more evidence you need. Right. So after the investigation, the police conclude that Lilit was the mastermind of the mass hangings. And they believe that he exhibited signs of altered mental health. That's what they basically dedicate to. There was this delusion and then it became a shared delusion. Police also believe based on all of the evidence that Lilit, with the help of his wife, Tina, tied the hands and legs of all the other family members. Mm -hmm. And that would explain the knots. But, you know, was it suicide? Was it murder? Did the 15-year-old boys who go to public school really want to take their lives did the grandma no. really want to so an article comes out on july 1st a year after the mass hangings and it was a son the oldest of the five children his name's dinesh again doesn't believe the results and he just basically comes out in this article saying i don't believe like i don't trust what the police have said yeah. so there is this you know a little bit of fighting back and forth with the results of the investigation On October 8th, Netflix comes out with a documentary series about the case called House of Secrets, The Barari Deaths. It explores the mental health issues implicated by this case. As summed up by India Times, the Barari deaths will forever remain an unresolved case since there are no witnesses in the case. But it did ignite the much needed discussion about the need to normalize mental health issues and the fatal consequences of patriarchy. The question remained, was this murder? Was this suicide? What exactly happened to the Batia family? Man, I mean, I'm pretty confident in what happened to them. Um, I do think it's hard because, I mean, think 15-year-olds, are not; their brains aren't fully developed. There's so yeah. much. I mean, you're just going along with what your family's I also think, saying. Yeah, I also think we... To be honest. You think that you'd be like, ah, I'd rebel against my family. But would you? Yeah, probably not. I mean, no, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of things. I mean, I've even done just because my family did it. Right. Until I was like 22, probably. Yeah. I just think you just don't realize. And I mean, I obviously this has been happening for 11 years. Those journals and notebooks had been being kept for 11 years. That's a long time for these theories to start kind of forming in these rituals yeah. to get a, just a little bit more cutting edge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's insane. So that is the case of the Batia family, 11 people hung to death. All right, you guys. Well, don't forget about our merch. Again, it's linked everywhere, and we will see you next week with another episode. I love it. And I hate it. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.